I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we are taking a deep dive into the book of Revelation. It is perhaps the most mysterious book of the New Testament, and author Sandy Miller has written a terrific book about that book. It is called Armageddon's Only Weapon is the Sword of Truth, and we are delighted to have her as a guest today, right now, live on Spotlight. Sandy, good to see you today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. First, let's start off with the title, Armageddon's Only Weapon is the Sword of Truth. Tell me what that's all about. Well, uh, in sermons about Armageddon over the years, it seemed that God had in mind to destroy his creation. And it seemed to me that if, if we had a God who wanted to destroy his, his creation, he wasn't a very good God. So I decided that I wanted to find out if that was true. And I started looking at the book of Revelation and studying it. And after a couple of years, I decided that that wasn't true at all that Armageddon's only weapon is the sword of truth. And the sword of truth was emerging from the mouth of the Christ that was resurrected uh, in the beginning of time as recorded by our calendar. Is there a reference to this sort of truth in the Bible or in the book of Revelation? Yeah, there is. It's um, in Revelation 19, 11 to 15. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and completely clean. Out of his mouth, that is the Christ, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nation. There you go, in black and white from the good book itself. Now That's it. For the folks who are viewing, who don't know much about the book of Revelation, I got to tell you, I had to study up more about the book of Revelation when I knew I was going to interview you today. I bet you did. <laughs> growing up, we weren't taught about it. I went to Catholic school from the time I was in uh, kindergarten all the way through college. And all of the books of the New Testament were looked at and studied and examined and interpreted but not the book of Revelation. So for those who are watching who aren't really familiar with the book of Revelation, tell me what the book of Revelation is all about. Well, that would be some job. I don't know <laughs> if I can do that. A little recap, perhaps. <laughs> A little <laughs> recap. Well, it's the book that everybody gets their end times information from. A lot of people are Revelation watchers. They read Revelation to find out how the world is going to end. They are the ones that believe that Revelations is a book which has a map telling us exactly what to expect uh, at the end of the world. And they believe that that's going to be the way that it goes. Now, if, if you believe that way, 
then you believe that some things are updated. For instance, if, if the book of Revelations suggests that horses would be riding in and uh, killing people, maybe these Revelation monitors would uh, have helicopters doing it and that their stings would be in the tail of the helicopter. But outside of an update of, of the technology, they kind of follow the end times narrative. I haven't taken that path in my book. I have taken the path of looking at John's John was one of Jesus' disciples. And uh, in John's uh, revelation, he, uh, he was the victim of his time along with Jesus and everybody else who was born under the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire worshipped the, the emperors. And so you were kind of at the mercy of whoever was the emperor at that time. It, he was kind of a god. He was a god, really. And he could decide what was going to happen to the people. And John's revelation was written with that kind of focus. And Christians were very, very unpopular people. I, I, I guess it comes down to the same issue it, um, is for this whole, whole, whole of the Bible. Is do you take the Bible literally or do you take it interpretively? And you seem to be taking more it as an interpretive uh, standpoint and not quite so literal, which I think most Christians at this point accept. Do you agree? I would think that that would be true. We we have a lot of history that we can look at. John's world and Jesus' world have the background of 500 years of continuous uh, occupation by foreign troops that the foreign troops were the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire, and then that was followed by the Romans. And the Romans were the worst because their emperors were treated as though they were deity. So they, if you had a bad emperor, life was intolerable for everybody. Exactly. Some people, I've read some religious scholars, actually believe the symbol 666 that's referred to in the book of Revelation refers to Nero. Do you have a similar yeah. belief? Well, either that or an emperor called Domitian. He was later in time, and the scholars believe now that he was probably the emperor that John was uh, imprisoned on this island by. So, but Nero was, he definitely was the emperor that the churches that John was the bishop of would be very familiar with. Nero at one point used the uh, Christians as his garden um, lights. He apparently poured some kind of, of uh, inflammant in inflammatory liquid over them and used them for garden uh, 
for his garden parties. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. So that's the cruelty of an emperor like that who was treated like a god who had absolute power. And you can understand why 666 that we now equate with the devil was equated with this totalitarian dictator. Yeah, and and Christians knew uh, very well, knew Nero. And uh, Peter and Peter the disciple and James, uh, who was Jesus' brother, were martyred by Nero. Mm -hmm. So, and that had probably taken place when, uh, when the book of Revelation was being passed around to uh, the seven churches that John had been the bishop of. Tell me a little bit about why you wrote this book. Was it to clear up all the misperceptions and misconceptions about the book of Revelation? Yeah, I really wrote it for my own benefit because I figured if I was going to stay uh, as a Christian, I had to believe that my God was good and that he would not destroy a creation that he had put in place and that I was safe believing in that kind of God. So I needed a God that was good. And I decided Revelation, the book of Revelation, was the reason I couldn't believe that he was good. So I took a couple of years out and really looked into it. And I was satisfied that God is good. And I wanted to pass that on. I felt like the world needs to believe that the God of the Western world is a good God. And I think that my book needs to be read. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I feel the view of the Christian world predominantly today is that our God is a benevolent God, a forgiving God. Um, and of course, that has to do with the teachings of Jesus that are laid out in most of the New Testament. And the book of Revelation, which seems drastically different from the rest, from your studies and your interpretation, and it's all documented in this book, really isn't that different, right? It isn't. It's just that John had a really hard task. He had to warn the seven churches, the Christian churches that were being persecuted. And he had to tell them, if you think that you've seen persecution, you ain't seen nothing yet. There's more coming. So he had to tell them that. And he still had to hold out hope that there would be good further up the road. So he had a really hard work to do and i think he did a good job of doing that and as a, as his reward since he while he was bishop of these seven churches and he there was a circuit that he traveled in uh between each of these churches and he sent letters circuit letters around that they shared and the book of revelation was one of those letters that was shared and he told those churches that they had to they needed to hold on to their faith because life was hard and it was going to get harder and they knew that because Nero was in power, probably, or he had or he had already been in power, and they knew that that was terrible. But Domitian, uh, one of the churches, the seven churches, uh, 
one of the people that Domitian, uh, he roasted him in a, in a uh, well, I don't know what he used to roast him in, mm-hmm. but he roasted him to death. And he was one of the martyrs. But John was in that, in the island, as a punishment because he kept telling everybody that Jesus was the Lord and Jesus was the king and Jesus is alive. He's been resurrected. Well, the Roman emperor didn't like to hear that because they were the ones that had to put Jesus to death because the uh, Jews didn't really have that power. They couldn't put anyone to death. So they had to get Rome to do it for them. Well, since uh, Rome put Christians to death, they didn't want to hear that Jesus was alive. (laughs) So, and especially since the emperor was supposed to be a deity and worshiped and the final authority in anything. Uh, So when John was advertising that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, Jesus is alive, they needed to exile him. So they did. Absolutely. Do you think from your studies, I know this has been a part of your career, you've actually taught the Bible for the better part of two decades now, as I understand it, at multiple college campuses. And I still do teach. And you still do. Yeah. Do you feel that there will be an apocalyptic event one day that'll end the world as we know it? I have no idea. (laughs) I really don't. There may be, uh, it could be for people that, that continue to reject the word of God, which is truth. At that point, they would be rejecting Christ because he is the word that is the spirit of truth. Well, if he if they reject that, they don't want to hear it. Maybe there is there will be things that happen that make them change their mind. Mm-hmm. You know, we all have to learn. And so maybe there is uh, there that series left behind that everybody thinks about and talks about kind of treats that way it's it's believes that uh, the people that follow Christ will be saved and that there will be people that will be left behind well I don't subscribe to to the left behind series but I can see that there might be people that have lessons to learn and that their life uh, might not be very pleasant if they if they don't want to believe in the kind of truth that will make them free of sin, sickness, disease, suffering, death, then at that point, maybe there will be uh, in time problem. I don't know. Yeah. I and have no idea. It's one of the mysteries of life. Um, I yeah. think early on in my religious education, we learned about anonymous Christians or the concept of anonymous Christians. And those are people who were never introduced to Christ don't know about the teachings of Christ, yet they live a life that is exemplary. And those are the people who will be included in the salvation as well. Yeah, like right now, the Bible is being translated into all languages. And people who 
haven't even had a Bible in their language are turning to Christ when they get a Bible in great numbers. So like you say, the this in our in our time, it looks as though the Bible will be translated into every language, even you know, even languages with only a few uh, people that speak them. Anyway, uh, the world is changing. Truth is changing the world. And I think I myself feel like from writing this book that truth is what is changing the world and that uh, the battle of Armageddon, which is supposedly the end times when Jesus comes with the sword in his mouth, that Jesus Christ and his army of truth bearers sharing the goodness of God with people everywhere is changing the world and that is what the battle of Armageddon, the final battle of Armageddon is. It's just truth continually changing the world and it's done so ever since the resurrection of Christ. And when you think about it, there is no more powerful weapon than truth. All you have to see is how people are so repulsed by the truth sometimes that they purposely turn deaf ears to the truth and that they actually try to rebut the truth. But the truth is eternal. The truth is what will set us free. That's true. That's true. And we can trust the eternal. Absolutely. I believe that. I believe that also. You must have had quite a journey writing this book. I think a lot of your life built up to this moment of spreading his word in your book and then putting the book out there for the people to read. Tell me a little bit what that journey has been like for you. I'm sure it's been a labor of love. Well, I've, I've been a student of the Bible all my life, and I've taught it to every age group, just about, from three-year-olds to senior citizens. So, and even to uh, special needs students. In the, in the 1960s, I, I initiated a, one of the first religious education classes for students with special needs. And the reason I did that was because my daughter was diagnosed with diabetes. And I was feeling real sorry for myself because I had this three and a half year old child that uh, was gonna have to have shots all of her life. And I felt sorry for myself. Well, I was sitting in church one day behind a lady who had a special needs child with, I don't know, some down, it wasn't Down syndrome, but some form of it. Anyway, I realized that I was very fortunate because this woman had a child that would never be able to be on her own while my daughter was going to grow up and be on her own. And that stopped my feeling sorry for myself. But from then on, I decided to start a religious education class for students with special needs. And I concentrated on what we called retarded students in those days. That was a long time ago. Thank heaven we've changed from that. But in cooperation with Ivo One at the Denver Area Council of Churches, I began to write special education curriculum and taught a group of 45 students from 
um, a school called Lairdon Hall in Denver, Colorado for several years. And influenced by that experience, one of the influences of that experience was one of the one of the students from Lairdon Hall was probably 45 years old, but he was still uh, a very naive person and spontaneous. And the students would line up uh, waiting to come into the church after they got off the bus and the pastor would wait there and they'd shake hands with the pastor as they went in. Well, uh, Jerry always greeted the pastor and kind of liked that. And so he, he missed the pastor one day and he said, when is God coming? And I, I said, when is God coming? God's always here. But he said, when is God coming? He, I finally realized he was talking about the pastor and the pastor was out of town and the pastor always wore a black robe. So I wrote a, that was my first article that I sold. I didn't really sell it because I, I gave it to our church uh, denomination for their, their uh, magazine. But the article that I wrote was called, When is God Coming for the Retarded? And at that point, I got really involved and worked with parent groups promoting Colorado legislation for equal education. And some of the people, the parents in our church had children that were special needs of one kind or another. And so they got involved in the, in the movement uh, for mental, and physical and emotional challenges for special ed. And that movement eventually mandated equal access to education for all students with special needs in the United States. So I, I was involved in that, not as involved as the parents of those students were, but I helped them get going. Anyway, uh, I did that. And then uh, that was that was how I got started writing. And that was my, uh, my start on teaching. Uh, well, maybe not so much teaching. I, I had already been teaching for a long time. Anyway. Well, it's, it's a wonderful story. We're glad that you did focus your effort on spreading the word of God. The name of your book is Armageddon's Only Weapon is a Sword of Truth. It is written by author Sandy Miller. It's available on Amazon. You can download it on Kindle like I did. You can actually buy a physical copy. It's an important book because it is one of the most misunderstood and most mysterious books of the Bible. It is the book of Revelation. And Sandy Miller does a wonderful job in breaking it all down in terms that will lighten your heart. Sandy Miller, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Well, thank you for having me, Logan. <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. And to the viewers at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.